There's moms here who have, who have uh, been mothers to countless children. There's moms here who are, are new at this. There's some that have been at it a while. And, and wherever you are uh, in all of that, we're so glad that you're here. And we're so thankful for what you're doing in this mom. And, and could I just tell you this morning, I, I, I'm not going to talk about this long, but I, I want to give you moms some encouragement this morning. Uh, some of you feel like you've been tied down because of your kids and you're limited about what you can do for the kingdom of heaven because uh, you are raising kids. And I, I just want to encourage you that uh, there's going to be some moms who get to the kingdom of heaven. When they get to heaven, they're going to have more crowns than many, pastor, many pastors who get there because they were faithful with what they did with their kids. Uh, moms, you're making an impact in the world today. Uh, you're raising those kids and you loving those kids and you uh, praying for those kids. It's making a difference. And it's going to change their world. It's going to change our world. And so we're thankful for you moms. And, and I'm thankful for my mom personally. Uh, I can honestly say I wouldn't be here today without her. And she taught me since I was a little bitty boy about the Lord and uh, she uh, has spent countless hours. There's no way of knowing how many hours she spent praying for me. And if I could encourage you moms to do one thing for your kids, it's be a praying mother. Uh, I've known in my deepest, darkest times or in the times that I was in danger uh, for one reason or another that uh, mom may not have been in Haiti with me, but she was anchored uh, in Sand Gap, Kentucky, in her prayer closet, keeping me safe by praying for me while I've been all over the world and doing all kinds of things. I can uh, always look back and know that my mom was praying for me. And so, moms, if I could ask you to do anything, be a praying mom. So, with all that being said, let's pray together right now. Father, we come to you this morning and uh, we thank you for everything, God. We thank you for the cross, Father. We thank you for your amazing grace, Father. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you this morning. Father, we thank you for moms this morning. and God, we pray that you would bless each one of those mothers today on, on this special day. But give them strength every day. It's easy to be a mom on Mother's Day, but sometimes... Uh, on Thursday nights when the kids won't go to bed. God, give them strength in that time. Uh, God, bless them everything that they do. And God, I pray in these next few moments that we share as a community, God, I pray that, that you give us strength and wisdom. God, give us insight into your word. And God, I pray that we could hear a word from you today. God, uh, we love you and we thank you and we need you in this moment. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. I uh, don't know if you know this or not, but uh, my parents caused me and my sister to have a drug problem when we were young. Uh, we were drugged to church every time that the doors were open. Has anybody raised up in church since you was little? Just leave your hand up. Look at all the dysfunctional people around. You see those people with their hands raised up? They've got problems. And they may come in, they may look like they're dressed up, and they may look like they're having a great time. But I promise you they got problems. And, and, and some of those problems are the direct result of being raised in church, okay? So I, my, my testimony is that I've been in church since I was a, a young boy. I was raised in church, uh, been in and around church my entire life, and uh, I was saved when I was six years old, six years old. So I've been uh, a Christian now for uh, 15 or 16 years. I think it's 16 years, September 16th, that I've been uh, a follower of Jesus. And, uh, but what I, I tell you that not to brag or anything like that. I, what I'm here to tell you today is that I spent my whole life in church and... I was raised in church, been around ministry my whole life, probably not missed over five or six Sundays of church in my entire life. Some of you are like, wow, that's awesome. But I'm not telling you that to brag, but what I'm telling you is that people who are raised in church, uh, 
sometimes we look at them and we think they don't have a testimony, they don't have uh, this big, God didn't bring them out of drug addiction or gambling or something like that. But I can tell you this morning that, that because I was raised in church and I was raised uh, by my parents in a godly home, I, I didn't have to deal with a, a drug addiction or alcohol addiction. I, I didn't have to be delivered from uh, being a thief or a gambler. But you know what? I did have to be brought out of, and I'm still in the process of being brought out of things like pride and self-centeredness and self-righteousness and looking down at other people. And so I'm getting at something this morning that sometimes when we come in church, we look at the people across the row from us, we look at the people who are up on stage, and we think they don't have any problems. When people come in, they think that we're perfect just because uh, we're here and because we look nice and because of all those things. But the fact of the matter is that just because you show up on, at church on Sunday morning and your hair is fixed, it doesn't mean your life is together. Can anybody identify with me? Uh, just because you show up and you're a really good actor for an hour and a half on Sunday morning doesn't say anything about who you really are as a person. Just because you can um, play as a Christian for an hour and a half on Sundays doesn't really say anything about you at all other than you come to church on Sundays. And I'm going somewhere. Stick with me. We're starting slow. Uh, just because people who come on Sunday morning, people who are raised in church, just because they're not struggling against a drug addiction or alcohol addiction, uh, things that we normally look down on, they are staring down things like gossip and anger and covetousness, greed and pride. And those things are just as dangerous and damaging as a drug addiction. But nobody ever wants to talk about those things. Because those things come a little too close to home. In Matthew 23, Jesus is talking uh, to these guys that we know as the Pharisees. And this particular scripture is known as the seven woes to the Pharisees. We could say the seven warnings to the Pharisees. And I need you to understand this morning who the Pharisees were. They were the religious people of the day. They were people who went to church in that day. These were people who were the Christian equivalent of today. These were the people who claimed to know God and know how to get to God. These were the, the Jewish men. And I believe that they had, had a genuine intent to serve God. I believe that the Pharisees in Jesus' day genuinely believed that they were doing what was right to God. I believe that the, that the Pharisees of the day who were the religious leaders honestly wanted people to do what was right in the sight of God. But they became so focused on rules that they disconnected from God's heart. That was the problem with the Pharisees. These were men who fiercely enforced God's law. They had good intentions, but they were way off base. And so these men focused on and they loved tradition so much that they confused truth with tradition. Have you ever met anybody who confused tradition with truth? These men were the, the people who were responsible for plotting and arresting and killing Jesus. They hated Jesus because Jesus pressed back against the way they thought and saw God. Jesus pushed back, pushed back against everything they knew or the, everything they thought they knew about God. They couldn't understand what Jesus was doing. And because they didn't understand Jesus, they worked to destroy him. Did you know that the only people in the Bible that Jesus was ever hostile to was the religious people? 
He was the on, they were the only ones that he ever got on their case. He would call them a den of snakes. He would call them a whitewashed tomb. He would call them all kinds of things right to their face. He would say things like, See those men over there, the Pharisees? Do what they say. Don't do what they do because they will destroy you. And I was, I was reading in Matthew 23 a couple years ago. And I was getting so mad at the Pharisees. I was seeing what the Pharisees had been doing. I was seeing all the trouble that they were causing Jesus. And I thought, man, them Pharisees. I wish they would get out of Jesus' way. I wish they would quit picking on people. I wish they would quit pushing people around. I thought, I wish they would quit enforcing the rules so much and start worrying about relationships. How dare they enforce the rules and neglect their relationships? How dare they say one thing and do another? And I was mad at the Pharisees. And I was sitting there, I, I don't even remember where I was now. I think I was in my room at home. And I was just beating up on these Pharisees. And Jesus, he, he gave me a thought that hit me out of nowhere. And he said, you are a Pharisee. You are a Pharisee. And so I, I'd been reading the Bible most of my life. And I had never seen that I was the Pharisee that Jesus was rebuking so sharply. I was the Pharisee that I was hating so much on. I was the Pharisee that was looking down on other people's sin because it was different than my own. I was the Pharisee who was saying one thing and doing another. Living one way in public and another way in private. And so in this season of my life, I had to wrestle with that. And out of that came this idea of the recovering Pharisee. I told God, I don't want to be a Pharisee, so I guess I'll have to be a recovering Pharisee. And if you've been around here a while, I preached a sermon on this a year or two ago. But I want us to take three weeks and talk about this topic of what it means to be a Pharisee and what we can do about that in our life. And... Uh, I read this quote this week by Adrian Rogers, and it will give you some food for thought. He says, have you ever wondered what a church full of Pharisees would be like? They would all attend church every Sunday. They would all tithe. Sounds pretty good to me. They would all work in the church and they would all go to hell. The title of the message today is, You Might Be a Pharisee If. You Might Be a Pharisee If. And some of you uh, have seen Jeff Foxworthy's famous, You Might Be a Redneck If. It's going to look like that, kind of. Uh, so I got a few lines for you if you... If you got time for a little laughter, this is going to be a little heavy today, so I'm going to try to break it up with some laughter. It is okay to laugh in church, okay? So if you feel the urge, go ahead. If you love to hear a good sermon about someone else's sin, you might be a Pharisee. If your public life is polished, but your private life is a mess, you might be a Pharisee. If you had rather talk about how someone needs help than actually helping that person, you might be a Pharisee. If you spend more time complaining about church than you do serving at church, you might be a Pharisee. If you are so proud to be so humble, you might be a Pharisee. Let that one sink in for just a minute. If you tithe 10% of your income and you make sure everybody knows it, you might be a Pharisee. If you consider the church membership or all the Lamb's Book of Life, you might be a Pharisee. If you love to gossip about other people's sin, 
You might be a Pharisee if you love to gossip about other people's sin. If you complain about the filth you see on your TV and you continue to watch it, you might be a Pharisee. The clicker still works. If you make a difference between your sin and somebody else's sin, you might be a Pharisee. One more. Can you handle one more? If you spend more time on your hair on Sunday morning than you do on your heart, you might be a Pharisee. I believe that if we were honest this morning, we could all say, or at least most of us could say, that we look a little like the Pharisees. And I believe that it's our natural drift as people who are involved in uh, a religion or a, uh, an organized way of doing things. I believe that it's our natural drift to drift towards being a Pharisee. I believe that it's actually a tactic of the enemy. He wants us to drift into this idea that because we're part of this church, we're better than other people who are outside of this church. The enemy wants to convince us that because we look different or act different than people elsewhere, that we are better than them. And so today I want us to look at a couple, actually five key marks of a Pharisee. Because I want us to be aware of how dangerous this is. And I want us to avoid this Pharisee trap with all costs. So the first mark of a Pharisee is that they value rules over relationships. They value rules over relationships. When I, when I say this, I mean that they're willing to sacrifice their relationship with a person to make sure that person follows the rules. Have you ever met anybody like that? No nudges, please, no pointing fingers. But Pharisees love to enforce the rules. You have to do it this way. They might even say this is the way that we've always done it. And they will sacrifice their relationship with you to get you to do what they want you to do. They will bend your arm and manipulate their relationship To get you to follow their rules. Pharisees are rule followers. Or at least they want people to think that they're rule followers. They're rule followers because they're rule makers. They make certain rules that they can follow and others can't. They want to make up rules that are not in the Bible. That you have to follow so that you can be part of the church. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees had written a big, long set of rules that were not in the law of Moses to keep you from breaking the law of Moses. It was an extra layer of rules. They created thousands of laws that they enforced against the people, but they didn't follow their self. And so when we see Jesus in the New Testament and he's being accused of breaking the law, he's not actually breaking God's law. He was breaking the laws that the Pharisees had established themselves. He was breaking laws that they had made up. In Matthew 23, 4, Jesus says this about the Pharisees. They tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear And lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. That means that that the Pharisees come up with all these rules and regulations. And they said, here, you all go and follow these, but we will not follow these. You do this, but we will do something else. They were 
more focused on rules than they were with relationships. In John 8, the Pharisees drag out a woman in the streets who's been caught in the act of adultery. And they probably dragged her out into the street naked. And they pressed Jesus to stone her. They were more worried about enforcing the rule against this woman than they were about taking the life of that woman. They had no grace to show this person. <coughs> they asked Jesus to stone this woman, but he replies, He who is without sin cast the first stone. He showed this woman grace instead of justice. She, he gave her what she did not deserve instead of giving her what she did deserve. Jesus always valued relationships over rules. Jesus would rather maintain the relationship than force you to follow the rule. The Pharisees, they elevated rules above people. They put out rules that nobody could follow and then punished people because they couldn't follow. I'm not saying that rules and regulations do not have their place. But what I'm saying is that as a church, we should never press somebody to follow the rules to the point that we lose the relationship. That the following the rules is not the end game. And a relationship is not a way that we achieve getting people to follow our rules. A relationship should be for the relationship's sake. If people are not willing to walk and talk just like we do, if people are not willing to do what we want them to do, oftentimes we write them off as a friend. We write them off as a person that we don't want to hang out, hang out with anymore. We want to distance ourselves from that person because they're not a rule follower. Pharisees love rules, especially rules they come up with. The trick is that Pharisees will often elevate themselves by following rules they created and put others down by making a big deal when they can't follow those rules. See, and, and you don't realize you're doing this and I don't realize that I'm doing it, but sometimes we all have like a list of sins that we really look down on, right? Right? Could, could, could you identify with me? And I could probably, I mean, we're in the Bible Belt, I could probably name pretty close your ten. And you would be like, yeah, those are horrible things. But we want to focus on those ten things and say those ten things are horrible and you shouldn't do them. And you shouldn't do them. That's absolutely right. But we say those ten things are the things you're supposed to stay away from while neglecting the ten things that we like to do. We never talk about the ten things we like to do because we're too focused on bashing the things that other people struggle against. And so, I guess I'll just leave that where it is. Sin's equal. It's equal around the foot of the cross. All sin's equal. All sin leads to death. So sin is sin. Is sin is sin. Uh, the second mark of being a Pharisee is that they always want their good works to be seen by others. They always want their good works to be seen by others. If they're asked to do something and there's no glory in it, if nobody will see them do it, they're not willing to do it. They're not willing to go out of their way to help if nobody's going to find out about it. And if they do, find, if they do, do something that is in secret or uh, that nobody sees, they're sure to go and tell somebody about the good thing they just done. <coughs> noticed it's quiet in here this morning uh, Pharisees are always quick to tell you about their involvement in the church their position in the church they're always wanting to tell you about the money they gave or the places they served I believe that there uh, is a place to be able to brag on God about what he's doing in our church and, and maybe even mention your part in it but I think it's important that if we're going to tell about good things going on, we always point to Jesus and say, let me tell you what Jesus is doing in our church. Let me tell you what God's working, not what I'm doing, but what He's doing. Um, Pharisees love for people to see them. 
They love for people to brag on them. They love when people say, uh, good job with that. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with that until you start doing things just to hear that. When you start doing things just to hear people brag on you, you need to stop doing things. They're motivated by people's perception of them. They're always worried about what other people will think. I know none of you are like that, but if you run into somebody who uh, is always worried about how other people will see it or how other, what other people will think, they might be a Pharisee. Um, they're more concerned about being in the spotlight than serving selflessly. Pharisees always want to be seen. If the attention is not on them, then they're not interested in being a part. Jesus warns about this in Matthew 6, starting in verse 1. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus is saying, don't do things to be seen by others. Do things because you love me and because you love them. Serving in the church should never be motivated by selfish desire, but by love for Christ and love for the brethren. The third mark of a Pharisee is that they're always more concerned about outward appearance than the heart. <coughs> Pharisees love to look the part when they come to church. When they're out in public, they want people to see how they look and how they act when they're in public. They spend much more time preparing their bodies than they do preparing their hearts. They oftentimes look especially well kept to compensate for the fact that their life is a mess. They want to look good on Sunday morning so that nobody knows that their life is a mess when they go back home. Their public life stand in stark contrast to the way they really are. They live one way in public and another way in private. There's a difference between what they do on Sunday morning and how they live the rest of their life. They work hard to make people perceive them as good people instead of actually doing the, good, the hard work of becoming a good person. They would rather dress up on Sunday morning than show up to be with Jesus through the week so their heart could be changed. It's okay. I don't need your amens. I'll just keep talking. <clears throat> Jesus says in Matthew 23, 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, means actors, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So, so you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You've got your act together on Sunday morning. But do you really live it the rest of the week? I'm not talking about a works-based salvation. I'm talking about becoming who you really are. Because if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you need to spend the time conforming your life into who you really are. Paul would say it this way, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means the salvation is on the inside and you need to spend the time working it out into your hands. Work it from your heart to your hands. Stop looking so good on Sunday morning. Stop spending so much time trying to 
make people believe you are a good person and start spending some time with Jesus and have Him transform your life. There's nothing wrong with looking good on Sunday morning, but if there's no substance in your heart to back it up, it's all useless. Pharisees often put on masks to keep people from seeing who they really are. Oftentimes they look like smiles, dress shirts, and skirts. They hide behind these things because they know in their heart they're really a mess. And they don't want anybody to see inside. That's why they love rules. Because if they can follow these five rules that everybody's worried about, they'll never see inside who I really am. They can hide their sinful hearts behind following the rules. Everybody okay? Are you okay this morning? The fourth mark of a Pharisee is that they're busy with religious activity. Busy with religious activity. They're always doing something, but they do it out of obligation and not out of love. Pharisees can take mission trips. They can cook for the church. They can attend Sunday school. But when they get to heaven, none of that will matter. Because they did it out of obligation and not out of love. <clears throat> Francis Chan said this about religious activity. He said, if God cared only about religious activities, then the Pharisees would have been the heroes of the faith. The Pharisees were the most religious people in Jesus' times. They'd done the most at church, is what I'm saying. And yet, they were the ones that Jesus rebuked the sharpest because they were so busy that they couldn't be effective for the kingdom. They were so busy working for God that when God actually gave them something to do, they were too busy to do it. Pharisees wear busyness as a badge of honor. They love to tell people about all that they're involved with because it makes them seem spiritual. It makes them seem like they really have something going on. The problem is that, that Pharisees are always too busy to really make a difference. In Luke 10, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. A man was beaten and left for dead by thieves, and two religious people passed by shortly after. But they are too busy on their way to their religious obligation than they, that they couldn't stop and, and be God's hands and feet for just a moment. They are blinded to love by busyness. Did you know you can be so busy that you're blinded to love? They couldn't stop to help a man who desperately, desperately needed it because they were on their way to fulfill some kind of religious obligation. Have you ever been so busy with church that you couldn't help people? Me too. I'll just answer that for you. Me too. Let's not be so busy, church, that we can't love people. If we get so busy and we get so many programs going on that we don't have time to love people, then the programs get put on the chopping block so that we can get back to what Jesus really wants us to do. You can do with that what you want. Finally, the fifth mark of a Pharisee is that they love to point out other people's sin. I know none of you are like that, but those people who didn't come to church like that, I'm sure they're like, the, the ones that didn't come to church today, I'm sure they're like that. Um, have you ever been around somebody who loved to point out other people's sin? They just, every time you talk to them, they're talking about what other, somebody else done wrong. And nobody likes to be around that person first off. And if you don't know that person, you are that person. Uh, the goal, uh, their goal is always to make other people look worse so that they look better. They always want to push down somebody else. They always want to distract you when you're talking with them uh, about somebody else's sin or how somebody else done wrong or or, or something else so that they don't ever get to talk about their sin. 
They're always pretty vicious when it comes to other people's sin, but they never want to talk about theirs. <coughs> They're pretty rough on other people's sin, but when they, it comes to theirs, they excuse it away. Uh, Pharisees love to demean people because of their sin, because they sin differently than they do. Oftentimes we hear people talk about how bad homosexuality or drug addiction is, but you rarely hear anybody speak against gossip or slandering or coveting. And you sure won't hear anybody in the church today talk about gluttony. Sin is sin is sin is sin. Just because they sin differently than you do doesn't mean anything. Pharisees are quick to point out where others are wrong, but they fail to see when they're wrong. I'm not condoning any sin this morning. What I am saying is that we've all got sin. We've all got sin. You've got sin this morning. You need to stop worrying about other people's sin and start worrying about yours. Stop talking about what they're doing wrong. Stop bad-mouthing them. <clears throat> Start dealing with your stuff. Jesus would say to the Pharisees, you're talking about the splinter in other people's eyes, and you have a log in yours. Stop talking about other people's sin. If you're going to talk about it, talk about it with them. Say, hey... I want to help you walk through this challenging season of your life. Get off everybody else's back and start looking at yourself. Sin's hard to see in the mirror, ain't it? Sin's hard to see in the mirror. Start praying about what you need to work on. And I promise enough stuff will come up that you'll be busy for a while. Dealing with that stuff. Pharisees have a hard time admitting when they're wrong. They believe that just because it originated in their mind, that they, it must be right. And you can't convince them that they're wrong. Pharisees are rarely wrong that they admit. A.W. Tozer said this about Pharisees, he said, a, a Pharisee is hard on others and easy on himself. But a spiritual man is easy on others and hard on himself. You need to be worried more about your junk than your neighbor's junk. Or your husband's junk or your wife's junk. Worry about yourself. Could I tell you that it's not your job to convict people of their sins? It's not your job to convict people of their sins. People know when they're in the wrong. You know why? Because we have a Holy Spirit that convicts us. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of their sin. And He's much better at it than you are. Lay off of other people's sin. It's not your job to judge. That's God's job. And he's much more just than you are. Changing people is not your job. That's Jesus' job. He's got that took care of. You know what your job is? You know what you need to be worried about? Loving people. Loving people. It's not your job to convict or judge or change. It's your job to love. And if you get your life consumed around loving people... You won't have time to hate anybody. I heard Mark Lowry, who sung with the Gaithers for forever. That may, you may know him from there, but he was talking about this subject, and he was talking about that phrase that we hate the sin and love the sinner. Have you ever heard that, or maybe you've said it? That's not a very good phrase, I don't think, and, and that's what he said. He said, how about this? Let's stop hating other people's sin. Let's start hating our sin, and when we get busy hating our sin, 
We won't have time to hate anybody else's sin. And then we can just love each other. How about that? Let's just love each other. Let's just love all the sinners and stop worrying about their sin. God can deal with that. And He will. So, today, I believe that to some extent or another, we've all can see that we're a Pharisee. Anybody with me this morning? Have you, have you heard what I've been saying? Uh, I realize that this is not fun. Okay, and I, I, I realize that you probably won't go out tomorrow and say, guess what, I, what, guess what he talked about at church yesterday? I felt so good when I left. I felt encouraged. I know that you probably won't say that. But here's the truth. If we don't hear this, if we don't realize this is going on, we're going to be Pharisees the rest of our lives. Who wants to get to the end of your life and realize that you were a Pharisee your whole life and you didn't help nobody and nobody wanted to be around you and nobody loved you and you didn't make an impact in their life? Nobody wants to get there. Everybody wants to look back and see that you loved well and you made an impact in people's lives and you helped people instead of hurt them. And you can't get there if you don't hear this stuff. I don't want us to fall into the Pharisee trap as a church. I don't want us to get so focused on ourselves that we get so self-centered as a church that we forget to love our community. That we forget to love the people who are around us. Let's not get so focused on rules and regulations that we lose sight of the people who are around us that need help. Let's not lay down relationships on the altar of rules. Let's be driven by love and not by religious activity. I want us to be a church that's more concerned about serving than being served. Loving than receiving love. I want us to be focused on loving the people around us. Let's be a church that's so busy pursuing Jesus with all of our lives that we don't have any time to yell at people about their sin. Let's focus on loving people and not putting people down. Let's be a church who's willing to go the extra mile to help somebody, even if it means that we don't get extra credit. Let's worry less about what people think of us and worry more about how we can love those people. Let's not be a better than church. We're better than you because of whatever reason. This morning, none of us is better than the next. We're all on equal playing field. Your sin is no better than anybody else's. Sin is sin is sin is sin. And the fact of the matter is, is that none of us can pay for our own sin. None of us can pay the price that we owe God because of our sin. We're all helpless and desperately in need of a Savior. We all need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need Jesus if you've been a Christian 50 years, and we need Jesus if you've uh, never heard the name of Jesus. People in here need Jesus. People out there need Jesus. We all need Jesus. We're on level playing ground at the foot of the cross. We all need Jesus because we have all sinned. We have all sinned. And we're all in need of God's grace. And His mercy today. Today, there's uh, two groups of people in this place. The first group is uh, the Pharisees who need to repent of being a Pharisee. The second group of people are the people who's never given their life to Christ. Never really made a decision to follow Jesus. Sure, you may have. Walked an aisle and prayed a prayer. But you know 
that you've never really made a decision to follow Jesus. I want you to know wherever you fall, um, I recognize that you already know that you have sin in your life. You already know that you're falling short. You already know that you're not all that you need to be. But Jesus would say in Mark 2 that it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. And I believe we have some sick people in the house today. Including yours truly. We all need Jesus. Jesus didn't come to save people who had their lives together. He didn't come to save people uh, who, who had it all figured out. He came to save people whose lives are a mess. And I just wonder if we were really honest this morning. If we couldn't all say that our life is a mess. I think we could all say that when you peel back the mask and you peel back the facade and you pull back the Sunday morning smile that really our life is a mess. We all got problems. And we all need a Savior. We all need a Savior. So this morning I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us. And when I get done praying, this altar is going to be open. There's nothing magical about this altar. It's just a place to pray. When I get done praying, I want you to spend some time praying yourself. If you're a Pharisee this morning and you just realized that you need to ask God to soften your heart. and To help you turn from that. And if you've never accepted Christ, you need to ask Him to forgive you of your sin and adopt you as a son or daughter. And so, Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning. God, all across this house, every single person in this place, God, we recognize that we are a sinner. All of us. God, I, I recognize in my own life that that I've drifted towards being a Pharisee. God, I help, pray that you would help me with that. God, help me to look at myself and deal with my sin and not look at others and try to deal with theirs. God, I pray this morning that across this house, God, that you would break chains of religiosity, God, that you would break chains of uh, a judgmental spirit, God, that you would break chains of of pride and self-righteousness and self-centeredness. God, I pray that you would break the chains of sin in our life. God, uh, there's people in this house this morning who have never accepted Christ. They've never been forgiven of their sin and they've never been washed in the blood. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would begin to convict those people right now. And God, that today they would make the decision to follow you to be forgiven of their sin and to give their whole life to you. God, I pray that they could do that right now, that you'd deal with them. God, we love you and we desperately need you. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen.